I'm here today with Adrian Hornsby, who is an award-winning writer of books and theatre across a rich kaleidoscope of interests. His books include The Good Analyst, a groundbreaking study of social impact measurement, The Chinese Dream, which investigates the rapid urbanisation of 400 million people, and most recently, along with Alexandra Yankovic and Tom Voskus, Disruption in Action, named as Smart Thinking Book of the Year at the 2023 Business Book Awards. I actually have a copy right here. Gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, so first of all, welcome, Adrian. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. Good to great see pleasure. you. And congratulations on the award. How are you feeling? Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, good. It was a thrill. Definitely. Yeah. Still smug? <laughs> I, well, I mean, blown away, I think, really. I, I feel, I do actually feel a little bit bad because when the, uh, I sort of felt being shortlisted was quite a, was quite a win. Um, and then the dinner was coming around and my co-authors, Alexandra and Tom said, well, should we come over? Because they're based in Amsterdam. And I said, it's really not worth it. We just got to show up for the dinner. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, put on the black tie, do the business and, and kind of shake some hands. You know, you save yourselves the time. <laughs> and then, of course, when the award came through, then who was on the stand? Okay. I'll take so. all the glory. <laughs> Anyway, so I got I got the the red carpet photos and the whole experience, but yeah, no, it was a, a real um, a surprise and, and a thrill and and yeah, a great um, a great sort of um, you know when you when you sort of write a book, you spend a lot of time you know like in in a bubble and then you kind of put it out into the world and it just kind of disappears a bit. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's not your I, book I anymore. Work... It's, it's co-creative with the reader. What's going to happen to it after next? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So you know, you never kind of really. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, you sort of see, the, you see some things online here and there, but, you know, you have an event and it sort of feels, oh, it's happened and somebody read it and they liked it. And yeah, all of that stuff was, you yeah, know, great affirmation. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the to first principles. What was the premise of the book? What was that kind of itch, you know, that sort of moment of creation where you go, do you know what? We should write a book on disruption in action. How did that happen? Well, it's a good question. So, and there's a bit of a backstory to this, um, in that this wasn't the this book follows uh, to some extent. It's a sequel to a book from 2018 that um, uh, Tom and Alexandra sort of made and I helped with, called "Make Disruption Work," and that one is much more of a it's it's sort of based around a model. And so, like many many business books, and and Tom and Alexandra kind of like forged this model, which they call the 5D model of how to make disruption work for you as a company. So what you need is you need uh, to discover, define, determine, drive, and delight in the change. And, you know, with these five models, then this kind of is the is the sort of structure for the book. Under each of these Ds is a bunch of principles as how you apply it. And, and the book is essentially sort of sets out this model and puts it out into the world. So we made that book together in 2018, and it was a bestseller in Holland, where they're based. It was, you know, kind of everybody was very happy, and it did well, and so forth. Um, but there was an interesting point of learning from it, which was that um, after it came out, Tom was on book tour, kind of shopping it around, presenting it in places, and he was at a leadership summit in New York. And he was presenting about the book, and he was working his way through the five Ds, and under the fourth D, drive, how you drive the change into your organization, then he had a slide about um, hiring a new digital leader. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out that the thing that you mustn't do is to just go and hire a digital guru. It just never works out. And on the slide, then there was a cartoon of a, of a digital guru in a lotus pose with a little sort of iPhone around his neck and a slash through it. So he knew this was a bad idea. So anyway, so Tom did the, the presentation. Afterwards, he was chatting with people and sort of smoozing and mingling. And the CEO of a large industrial sort of global giant came up to him and said, you know, Tom, I love the talk. So insightful, great, great, you know, very smart, great insights. Um, can we have lunch sometime? So Tom said, of course, fantastic. So they exchanged business cards. Tom flew back to Amsterdam feeling very happy about things. You know, it looked like a big fish. And um, a couple of weeks later, he hadn't heard anything. So he thought, all right, let's, let's sort of follow up on this one a bit. So he sent him an email and said, you know, hi, how are you doing? And um, a couple of hours later, very quickly, got a reply back. The CEO said, Tom, I haven't forgotten you. Really excited. We actually have huge news. I think you're going to like this a lot, but I can't reveal it quite yet. So just give me another couple of weeks and you'll get the press release. So anyway, so Tom waits. Sure. Okay. A couple of weeks later, press release comes through, you know, headline, Tom, look at this. And uh, they were big announcement. They just hired a new digital leader. And guess what? It was the biggest digital guru in the industry. <laughs> So uh, this was something of a learning point for us. And then we kind of thought, well, and it, uh, his, the guy was at the presentation. He saw the slide and yet the mistake occurs. And you have this sort of like bizarre feeling that you're, you're presenting PowerPoints, but the world isn't changing. What could, what could be going on here? So anyway, we sort of remembered that. And a couple of years later, um, in 2020, obviously the pandemic happened. 
everything digital went vertical, so digital working, digital streaming, digital commerce, everything was going insane. And Tom said, okay, we need, really need to do another book about digital. And, you know, we've got to kind of get, uh, you know, to catch this wave. And I said, all right, so what have we got? What are we going to talk about? And um, he said, okay, well, I've been crystallizing our ideas and I've been working on a, a PowerPoint deck. I'll send it through to you, see what you think. And so he sent me through a 368 slide deck. And I sort of started grinding my way through it. And there was a, you know, there's a lot of ideas in there, a lot of opacity, a lot of abstract language. But as I was crunching through it, then I could sort of parse out most of the slides fitted under one of the five Ds. I could sort of post it out quite neatly. So I got on a call with Tom again and I said, you know, like this is all good stuff, but it also it feels like it's all in line with the 5D model that we've already talked about. You know, like the principles hasn't changed. And Tom said, like, well, it's true. The principles haven't changed. Well, the principles. Which you'd expect. Of which is which, which you'd expect. And I said, well, that's great. You know, we, we want that. We've validated true. our principles. Excellent. We've validated our principles. But how are we going to get out of the loop of sort of, you know, we do another book. It's going to be the wedding party too. <laughs> and Tom said, I... You know, I, I, I hear you, I hear you, but I just know we've got another book in us because we've learned so much. Mm. And I said, well, like what? And he said, well, you remember that CEO who a couple of years ago hired the digital guru? I was speaking to him last week. We're still working together. It's such a mess. Like the, the, the kinds of, and he started telling the story of what happened and how the rest of the leadership responded. And, how, and as he was talking, I said, you know, Tom, that's really interesting. And I also said, you know, I bet if we told that guy this story a couple of years ago, it would have gone in much deeper than just the principle. You know, like we don't learn from, you know, sort of abstract principle crystallizes knowledge we already have, but it doesn't allow us to absorb new knowledge in, in nearly the same way. It just doesn't have the same feel. And, and Tom said, well, of course. And this is something that, that, that we know. I mean, so Tom and Alexandra, they regularly organize CEO roundtables where they get high-level leaders together in a closed room and people share war stories. And, and this is, you know, the highest value information. People talk honestly about what really happens. You kind of like discover all of this stuff. And, and this is why these things are, uh, you know, people attend them because you, you really get the real learning out of it. But as Tom said, this stuff, it's all unprintable. You know, like we can't reveal everything about a client. People lose face. There's confidential information about companies. And I said, okay, there's a trick here that we can use. And that is we can fictionalize the stories. We keep the core points the same, but we create a made up company. We change the names. We sort of move some characters around. And that way we can use the, the art of fiction in order to tell the truth. You know, in the way that a typical case study either anonymizes or erases all of the good, all of the juicy stuff. And so we use this idea. We had this approach of saying, all right, let's have really frank conversations about case studies inside companies. We'll go to the companies, we'll get the real information. And Tom and Alexander, I, sh I should mention as well, are management consultants. They work with a bunch of the biggest companies in the world. They go deep inside, they manage these digital transformations, and they've done over a thousand projects at this point from 10 years in business. They've seen these things play out over and over again, and they've got these, these juicy stories. And so we just kind of shared them, interviewed all of the people together, and then I move some people around, collapse some cases into, into sort of archetypes and, and made these stories. Amazing, really insightful view into how you did it. Thank you. That's, that's really fascinating. So what I'm noticing is you've got all the um, underpinnings in place. You've got the case studies from real life. You've got the, mm -hmm. the model and the principles and the expertise and the credibility. The thing that's different about this book, I think, and what I'd love to get a bit more information on from you is how you transmutes that into the lightness of touch of the storytelling because there's a there's a sort of journalistic almost heavy quality to case studies which is the absolute opposite of what you've got here it's funny there's lots of dialogue there's this little running joke about shall I pour you a schnapps that means you're out the door you know? there's just these, this lovely um it's it's fictionalized in a way that um if you tell somebody to fictionalize stuff and they are not an expert fiction writer they will do it in a really heavy-handed way how do mm -hmm. you get that playfulness, that lightness of touch, the thing that really keeps somebody reading and engages them? That's a big question. It, it is a big question. It's actually, um, so there is a, there's a sort of, there's a deep point around this, which is, I mean, one, I think, I mean, it helps that I also, you know, write fiction, work in theater, I've, you know, got a background of, of trying to engage um, audiences with, you know, the, in, in the fiction world. 
But I think as well as that, I mean, e- like even with that background, I had a significant revelation when I was working on this book, which was, um, it, it, I think it's worth talking about because so when we started, when we kind of, I had this story approach idea and I was reasoned, you know, I thought I could pull it off and, and wanted to make it funny and, and readable and all that kind of stuff. But I also, I had the initial concept that what we're going to do is, you know, essentially what we have is, is a bunch of dense business information that we're trying to convey. And I'm going to use a story as a vehicle to get that across to the reader. And so all I need to do is I've got my vehicle, the story, I just kind of pack in the business information, drive it through. And um, the way that I went about this was I interviewed the sources involved um, from the, you know, the top level people, head of implementation down to the shop floor, got all the perspectives, wrote up a story, which would typically be around sort of three to 4,000 words. And then I sent it back to the sources to get their take on it. Um, you know, one is obviously I want to make sure nobody felt burnt. And, and then also was it accurate? You know, is what I'm coming up with true here. And so the, the feedback, was, you know, people were generally happy with stuff, but they'd always kind of say, okay, well, this detail here, like there's a bit more to it or, or, or you know, to understand that you need this. And so there'd be sort of more stuff added or, you know, this insight here is good, but also in another situation. So stuff would, would kind of come in and I'd work that into the draft and I'd be up at five, 6,000 words to send it back around to people. And um, there'd be more feedback, 7,000, more nine, you know, and the story was getting longer and longer. And the problem that I had was exactly, you know, like I knew that this lightness of touch was disappearing. It was getting swamped and the story was becoming gruesome. It was like, grindingly unreadable. And, and I sort of thought, well, I don't know what to do because my vehicle, like if the story is like this kind of old jalopy truck and I've got 17 mattresses stacked on top of it and, and the truck's kind of, you know, bouncing along and a wheel pops off and it goes in the ditch and, and you know, I lost the reader. But I don't know which mattress to take off because all of the business information is good. You know, there's going to be checked with lots of people. So, yeah, well, you know, I don't know what to take out. And so I was a bit of a loss for this and I didn't kind of know, you know, we sort of talked about where we could go. And so I pulled in a, a good friend of mine who's also an extremely experienced and excellent editor called Jeremy Mercer. And I said to Jeremy, you know, like, help me out with this. So, you know, where do we go? And so um, he, he sort of ground through the stories and we got on a Zoom call and he said, okay, Trent, first of all, let's take, let's take story two, the acquisition. Just tell me the story. And so I started trying to sort of fumble my way through it and, and got lost and, and, you know, I could feel where he was losing interest or confused and so on. And, and this process of having to sort of do it live and, and what happened was Jeremy and I developed this technique where we'd bounce the story back and forth between each ourselves until we could make it into a four minute anecdote that we could both tell and be giggling when we told it. And that was like the click moment. And then I could go back and write the story. And the, the real revelation was that this idea I've got business information to convey and the story is a vehicle is totally the wrong way around. I have a story to convey and the business information is the vehicle, right? The information is what drives the story forward. So every time I'm in a situation where a character is faced with a decision, they need some information to figure out what's going to happen next. So they, 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 that's where the information comes in and it drives you to the next decision. And then something else happens. Well, why? Information is required. And that's what keeps you driving forwards. And every time a piece of information drives the story forwards, it's relevant, it's good, it's what the reader wants to hear. Every time there's a piece of information which isn't driving the story forward, it's got no business being in the story. And so at that point, suddenly my 17 mattress problem just evaporated and the scales fell off because I had this incredibly powerful tool to know what to keep in and what to get rid of. And so at that point, I just chucked out all of the stuff that wasn't moving my characters forward. I, I got down to the story and you know, suddenly it turns into a, a total burner. You know, I mean, the page is just like flying by yeah. because every time something, you know, a corner is turned, the information you need is that. And so that made the stories work much better. They came right back down to size. You know, the lightness of touch sort of like comes back through again. It's fun. It's nice to read. But the really interesting thing was that after a, I'd done the seven stories which the book is based around. And then at the end of each story, then the learnings which are extracted, which I did deductively. I said, okay, you know, what have we really learned from this story and pulled it out? Then I, I gathered together all of the learnings, all of the little inside boxes, and compared them to the 368 slide deck that we started with. And I just like crossed things off and everything was covered. And the amazing point was that if you if you have a couple of different situations of which, you know, these real business problems are, are 
at playing out and you just talk about the information you need to know for each one and you do it and you do a bunch of them everything you need to know will naturally be covered and it just you you dissolve all of the problems of the repetition and the boringness and so on and so on because you just like whenever information is pertinent it's there and you trust that rule and by the time you get to the end you'll have covered your bases as it's just a brilliant masterclass in in how you use storytelling in in business writing because you're right i think most people see have it the wrong way around see, see the story as the way that they are presenting this information is in a story format but actually if you prioritize the story it, it just changes your mindset completely i love that it, it, it changes your mindset completely and it really it's it's such a lesson that you know don't worry about the information yeah. if the information's if, if you really need to know it the story will require it yeah and you're right because if you i find this often with people who are writing about their own life as well they know it so well that they, they bring in all these details and well you know i should just explain that <laughs> you're like, you yeah, 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 killed yeah. the story it's now lying dead on the floor because I've absolutely absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah but it's also the discipline of of, of having someone else yes you know, that outside, thing the, book, doing it outside out the industry doing it out loud and you know you just like see when when yeah. jeremy's eyes were glazing <laughs> over us oh <laughs> you might lie to yourself, but you cannot lie to the person who's yeah, yeah, like, oh, this, this isn't relevant, is it? No, no. <laughs> Brilliant. I want to talk about the publishing as well because it's a very beautiful book. It's it's full color. Just uh, if you're looking at it on Zoom, I'm just going to find a, a color. There you go. It's got some color and pictures and stuff. That's probably not the best example. Sorry. There you are. That's a nice one. Um, and it's a lovely sort of and cartoons and, and cartoons. cartoons. Yes, it's a lovely cartoon of somebody looking very dismal at some point, which I, I liked a lot. Um, <laughs> So tell us about the publishing journey. What was your thinking and decisions and the process around that? There he is. Sorry, I've just found my dismal person. There he is. Terrific. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The hang dog walk. The yeah. hang dog walk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so with that, it was uh, it was interesting. It was it was really so on this front, then my co-authors, Tom and Alexandra, um, were really uh, driving the process. And um, they were quite clear that um, we should self-publish, which was quite a big decision. And it was also an elective one. So, you know, we have uh, links with a couple of business schools. There was definitely a a route to go through a university press and put it out like that. And the decision to self-publish was really threefold. I think one is that it gave us much greater control over timeline in particular. You know, you don't have to sort of wait a year. You know, it's like this stuff is relevant. It's hot now. We want to put it out. We finish writing, you know, and, and we printed and published like, you know, within a month of finishing the manuscript. It was super fast. Um, the other thing, of course, that you get is, you know, amazing editorial control. You can decide to, you know, according to, you, know, you make your own budget and then say, all right, you know, we do want color. We do want a nicer binding. We do want to kind of make it the object that we want to make and, and, and content wise do all of the stuff that we need there. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is that it's um, it comes through Spark Optimus, which is the business that Tom and Alexandra co-founded. And um, they wanted to very much make it a Spark Optimus product. So it'd be something that they'd be able to, you know, have us their, their kind of branding, have a piece of their identity, be able to give it to clients mm-hmm. and also have control over, you know, like, you know, who you give it to, what kind of like where you do giveaways who you make special deals with, you know, let's say a company that they're working with wants, you know, 500 copies for all of their senior managers across Europe. You know, all of that stuff is much simpler if you don't have a publisher in the way. So there were a lot of, um, you know, sort of tangible good Mm. reasons to self-publish. And so that's the route that we went down. Um, Having said that, there are drawbacks. And I don't think it's realistic to say that that there aren't. I mean, there's sort of one version of the world in which, you know, to be able to get great distribution now, you can just upload your book to Amazon and it's going to sit there, which is true, right? But there are also, there are 500,000 books on Amazon and 490,000 of them are just sitting on an endless shelf. Yeah, there's right? more than 500,000. It's more like 3 million, but yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 there you go. Well, no, like in your category, in your category. Oh, I see what you mean, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so at that point, then then how do you get visibility? You know, like within the Amazon cockpit, there are millions of little knobs and levers and tweaks and 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 publishers have real knowledge and they know how to figure this stuff out. And also and Amazon lot... isn't the end of the world. You know, there's, there's Amazon's Amazon is, not, is, no, is a big part of the book trade, but there's huge, huge part of it beyond that. Well, completely. So how do you get relationships with bookstores? If yeah. you want to go and do a reading, if you want to go and do a presentation, if you want to approach and, and with a lot of those approaches also for, for um, sort of physical book distributors, then if you're self published and every time you're going into one of those conversations, um, you're always a little bit defensive and, and a little bit behind the eight ball. 
and and having an external publisher it's, it gives you you know all of these people there you know have many dozens and dozens of books come out every week in the uk and people are desperately looking for a way to filter down yeah. which ones they should be interested in and so if you have a publisher then that can help you a little bit to kind of get that first um conversation in it's such so, you, you just encapsulated there it's all the kind of moving parts of a decision that any business owner takes i think it's it's about control it's about speed to market it's about distribution muscle also actually what you didn't mention there is um translation rights so you know that that's another mm. thing that a publisher does um but and and just and quality control and so on but it's also about how you use the book in the business because if you're buying yeah. it at author discount from a publisher that's a really expensive way of buying multiple copies absolutely yeah yeah and if you're Thinking, I mean, depending on how many copies you want to, to have a control over, then yeah, it can be, you know, like versus printing it yourself yes, and, and just having difference. those books, you know, and you know, you don't have to ask someone every time and so on and so on. And yeah. so the yeah, there are there, it's a real it's you know, there isn't a single answer, you know, for, mm. for different people and the roots are, are right in different ways. I think on the translation rights, which is also a really good point with this one. We now have an edition coming out in Germany in September, so a great delight. Um, and with that, we are going with a German publisher because, again, they know the market, they've got the presence, they could figure out the translation. Um, and I think that there then, I mean, I think the, the bonus that we have is having had the, UK, the the English language edition come out and do well and you get this award, then we had greater leverage to be able to then start getting, you know, this the German translation. It means that we'll be at the Frankfurter Bookmesse Oh, come see September. you there. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's nice to, and and to some extent, but there is a way in which, like, having done the this deferred the English edition uh, self published, then it's it's a block to get into the publishing world with subsequent editions. Yeah, it's so fascinating, and I guess the takeaway is you have options, which is yeah, it, it, it does make life more complex, but that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. You have options in a way mm. that you maybe didn't do twenty years ago, so that's it's exciting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I always ask my guests for their best tip. I'm really, really interested. If somebody's just at the start of their business book writing journey, what's, I guess I'm asking also, it's a long time since you started writing, but what do you wish you'd known when you, when you started? You know, what would you tell people? Oh, well, no, it's uh, it's definitely, that's, uh, that's an easy one in a sense, because I think, so when I, I read English literature as a degree and came out of university and, and you have this idea that the the, sort of the, the literary tradition has this concept of, of you know, Milton's Il Penseroso. You've got a sort of a genius in a tower with an oil lamp who works for years and years and, and delivers a masterpiece which just kind of drops out perfect. And then everybody studies it for how wonderful it is and so on. You couldn't dare to suggest that, you know, Milton was confused or got a line wrong or anything like that. And um, I think this model can work. But for that to be successful, you need to have, you know, tens of thousands of inner Panzeroso sitting in towers pushing out bad books mm. um, and you know, the failure rate is enormous to get the occasional masterpiece that comes out and you can figure out that what you're working on is not a masterpiece without spending 10 years on it right and and the process the I think you know I mean so the, really the point here is speak, get feedback but the point at which you get feedback can be a lot earlier than after you've like written the whole book, polished it, spent hours and hours and hours, you know, just like early stage, yeah. you know, as you're writing concept. concept. Yeah. Concept, make sure that, you know, you can, you can say to somebody else what you're talking about yeah. and you give the, you give your drafts to somebody outside the writing process, preferably outside the, the subject area as well, get them to give you feedback. And when they give you feedback, usually people will try to be supportive and they'll try to give helpful suggestions. And usually the suggestions that people have, not always, but very often they're bad, right? And it's also, it's not their job. It's mm -hmm. not the job of your reader to solve your problems. But what they do do is they tell you where your problems are. Yes. If a reader has a, you know, is confused at a certain point, has a burning question that you haven't answered, or most importantly, if they're just flat bored, you need to know that. And, and you need to get that information as you're writing so that you can start, you know, when you're writing a book, you're, you know, typically people write a book because they are, I want to write a book because I've got like something to say and I've got a voice and, and you know, it's, like, it's very me orientated. It's, it's the wrong approach. A book, you're, you're in the services industry. You are serving a reader. 
and you need to you know be in touch with that reader what what are their problems what are they upset about what are they not understanding you know and and where are you losing them you've got to stay in touch with that i think that's possibly the the main difference between writing literary fiction and writing a business book is that literary fiction is is much more about self-expression it's much more about you bringing your uniques to the world and you know the people who love that will love that whereas writing a business book you're serving you are if it doesn't make sense to the people you're writing for there's no point in this book yeah Uh, yeah absolutely yeah yeah. feedback yeah and i think it's also i mean i've read stacks and stacks of business books now and and a lot of them are very you know, they're, they're hard to read. They've got a bad mm. rap, you know, I mean, and I think that there are a lot of different reasons people put out a book and the worst one and most typical one on some level is that it's a big business card. And, you know, you sort of, I, I mean, there were dozens of books that I read where I felt that if the point of this was to create a business card and, and you know, the, the person who's on the cover is far too busy to write it and the person who's writing it doesn't you know have any relationship with the reader and the 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 you know in between the covers is just kind of like placeholder text then you're kind of missing the point by reading the book in the first place because nobody ever expected this book to be read that's why it's so bad but if you're going to write a book that you actually you know when you're going to spend time on it and money then then make it make it work for a reader Wonderful. And also the writing process is so valuable, isn't it? I always pick people who sort of delegate oh God, yeah. missing out so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the, the, the thing which I find a lot is that when people, people often think they have a, you know, it's like, I've got great ideas, but I've, I'm not a fantastic writer. I've got a writing problem. So I'll just kind of like, you know, pull in a writer and, and, and burble at them and, and they can just turn it into perfect prose. And is they're burbling and you go, like, listen, is there, well, the problem that you have here, it's not a writing problem. It's a thinking problem, right? When you try and write, it exposes how incoherent all of the stuff you're saying is. And that's why the thing falls apart when you get to the writing stage. You know, when you write, the the, the discipline and the, the level of demand upon the clarity of thought is just that much higher. And you sort out your ideas when you when you write something. Yeah, and that's why you do it. Yeah, couldn't. And have that's it. why that's, you do it. That's, that's why brilliant. you do it. Yeah, love it. I always re- um, ask people to recommend a book as well. So, Adrian, what what book would you recommend that people listening read if they haven't already? Well, many people would have done actually. So, the but I hadn't. And when we started on this book, then it was uh, my co-author, one of my co-authors, Tom Voskas, uh, said, you know, have a look at Parkinson's Law by Northcote Parkinson, which is. A, Total classic. And it's interesting because, you know, we were doing a book about digital business, which everybody kind of thinks, you know, it's very sort of like up to the minute yeah, and tech and, you know, century. kind of new, very, very, very 21st century. And and so I, I hadn't read, knew about Parkinson's Law, but, but you know, actually read the book. It's very funny. It's very charming. It's about people who haven't heard of it, 1950s business administration, particularly in the British civil service. And the amazing thing is it's so pertinent. And it's so relevant and it's so recognizable. It's so on the money because, of course, what Parkinson is writing about is people and trying to get people to cooperate and, and you know, do a project and do useful work as opposed to meaningless work. And, and you know, the situations that, that arise out of that. And, and that's the same in the 1950s as in the 2020s. And it will be for decades to come, even with all this generative AI coming in. Businesses are about people cooperating yeah. and and. And that's certainly what, what we knew we wanted to write about in this book. You know, we've done a book about principles. This one's about people. Yeah, brilliant. And do you know, I haven't read the book either. So that's a, that's a great call. It's, you would, it's, it's really fun. It's fun. Yeah, I bet it is. Brilliant. Thank you. Wonderful uh, recommendation. Now, Adrian, I'm going to guess you've got quite a lot of places to point us. But if people, <laughs> people want to find out more about you, uh, more about the Optimus, more about the book, yeah, give me all the links and I will put all the links on, okay. on the show notes. Well, so first and foremost, the book itself is disruptioninaction.com. So you can go there and you can see, among other things, even if I say so myself, a delightful one minute video trailer, as well as the quotes, the blurbs and and the links outwards. Um, And the publisher and the business behind the book itself is Spark Optimus, so sparkoptimus.com. And that's the business of my co-authors, Alexandra Yankovic and Tom Vosquez. And then for me personally, as an author, I also have my own website, which is adrianhonsby.com. Fantastic. Not actually as many as I feared. That's brilliant. I'll put those all up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com. What an absolute joy to talk to you, Adrian. Thank you so much for for all those insightful, um, just the way that you have talked about the writing of the book really brings it alive and is so practical and useful for anybody who's undertaking the same journey. So thank you.
Well, thanks so much for having me on. And yeah, it's, it was a pleasure to write the book and it's fun to talk about it as well. Oh, actually, you know, I did say one last thing about another thing, which is also super important when you're writing a book is enjoy it. <laughs> if you're bored, if you're bored, your reader will be too. They can sort of sniff that out. You really should be enjoying writing. <laughs> That's a great last tip. Just about to press stop. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Put it in under the wire. Amazing. Thanks. Okay, Thanks, Adrian. Thanks so much.